Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you very much for joining us for this morning's discussion. My name is Andrew Macklin. I'm the managing editor of Renew Canada and your host and moderator for today's event on addressing market capacity in Canadian infrastructure. Uh, so glad you're with us this morning. We're going looking forward to a very good 90 minute chat with three very senior level people within our construction and infrastructure industry here in Canada who will provide their insights on the issue of market capacity. Before we introduce our three speakers, I want to introduce all of you to the platform in case this is your first time joining us for one of our Crowdcast monthly discussion events. First of all, you'll see on the right hand side that there's an active chat already underway. And we provide you some information regarding how to tag us, Renew Canada, as part of today's discussion, as well as the hashtag for today's event, Construct Market Capacity. We invite you to come in, introduce yourself, let everyone know that you're here and what organization you're from, and by all means, uh, provide some information of your own during the chat today. If you have any you know, links that you think would be valuable for people to appreciate during today's conversation, any interesting reports or that, we would encourage you to include that in this morning's chat. Along the bottom of your screen, you'll see some other important ways that you can in, uh, in that, yeah, sorry, that you can in, get yourself involved in this morning's conversation. You'll see along of the bottom that there is a poll section and we'll be populating that with some poll questions that we hope you'll take the time to vote on during today's discussion as that's valuable information that we can use as part of our deliverables for today's event. You'll also see the opportunity to ask a question along the bottom. Please, if you have any questions for our speakers at all at any time during today's event, please put them there. If you have any technical questions, I'd like you to please put those in the chat. Please use this ask a question section only for questions about today's discussion, uh, questions that we can use for our speakers. You will also see there's a little green button underneath me right now that says Renew Canada. Throughout today's conversation, we'll be providing live links to information to websites that we think are of importance, not just Renew Canada's site, but also the site of each of our three speakers. So in case you want to learn more about the organizations that they represent, it'll be a great opportunity for you to be able to click on their website and learn more about the work they do. You'll also be able to see in the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see Clip Moment. What that will allow you to do is clip the moment in today's conversation. If you think there's an important moment that you want to be able to reference later in our conversation, you'll be able to press that button. You'll be given a link and you can put that in a new tab and that will allow you to come back to that moment in time during the conversation. Speaking of coming back to the conversation, just want to also remind you that yes, Within a few hours of the end of today's broadcast, you will be able to come back to this very link and be able to watch this broadcast once again at any time using this link. So please feel free to do so at any time. Like I said, it takes a couple of hours for Crowdcast to get the broadcast back up onto the website, but you'll be able to access that recording probably by mid to late afternoon today. So that option is available to you. Other than that, we look forward to a very engaging conversation. And uh, without further ado, I think we'll just jump in with both feet and get our conversation started. So it is my pleasure to introduce our three speakers for today's conversation. Michael Lindsay is the president of Project Delivery at IO. Before being at IO, he was the head of strategic partnerships and government at the Investment Management Corporation of Ontario. And before that, he also held senior positions at IO, at McKinsey and Company, at Hatch, and at Queen's University. Michael, welcome to today's conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Andrew. Happy to be here. And we will introduce our second speaker is the president of the Canadian Construction Association, Mary Van Buren. Mary has been in that position since October of 2017. Before that, she was the vice president of marketing and technology at the Canadian Real Estate Association. And there is Mary. Good morning, Mary. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. And and lastly, we have Bill Ferreira, the Executive Director of Build Force Canada, a position that he's held since August of 2017. And he spent nine years before that with the Canadian Construction Association, most recently in the position of Vice President of Government Relations and Public Affairs. And we'll have Bill join us shortly and we'll round out our, our conversation with all four of our speakers. So thank you very much for joining us this morning. And while we wait for Bill, I, I'm, I'm sure he'll be here momentarily, but let's get started with the very simplest of simple questions. Does Canadian infrastructure have a market capacity issue right now? 
And do you believe it is more or less of an issue since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic? Michael, why, why don't we start with you for that? <laughs> nice to start with the softball. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, <laughs> look, uh, uh, prior to the, the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, Infrastructure Ontario had been charged by the government of Ontario with delivering an incredibly ambitious pipeline of capital projects, uh, $60 billion in total. Uh, and we were investing quite heavily in understanding what the market's capacity ultimately was to be able to be responsive to that pipeline. Uh, and in particular, we as an organization are always trying to focus on the things that we know make a difference, uh, you know, to, to otherwise ensuring that there is the right type of capacity in the market. You know, we want project staging that staggers projects and balances uh, you know, the, uh, the, the need to, to, to give people time to prepare and respond uh, against, you know, government's uh, consistent desire, obviously, to deliver infrastructure as fast as it possibly can. You know, we are not only trying to deliver a, a sense of a pipeline on a recurring basis, and we, we did it last week, but also to give real details around staging, uh, to give the market the best possible information about the projects that are coming down the pipeline at them. By the way, that's not just the capital projects themselves. We're also trying all the time to provide uh, to the professional advisors who support us in bringing those projects to market with a sense of um, whether it's planning and design consultants or technical advisors or owners engineers, the kinds of needs that we'll have in those places and spaces too, uh, so that uh, those firms can adequately prepare. And we are constantly using uh, updates, uh, uh, you know, of uh, third party research that we commission or consume uh, around constraints on labor to inform provincial assumptions on uh, any potential cost escalations for budgeting purposes or or to, you know, otherwise uh, let the provincial decision makers know where they should be investing effort in respect of growing labor availability in a variety of different ways. Uh, so all to say, we're very thoughtful about the question. Uh, and, you know, we know that uh, COVID-19, if nothing else, has done two things. The first of which is that it is clearly, uh, you know, put government into a thoughtful posture and, and will continue to do so over the course of the summer around what, if anything, is ultimately going to be adapted, amended, added to in respect to the capital pipeline that we've, uh, we've just reconfirmed. So, uh, you know, there's a distinct possibility that there's more coming. And we also know that there's more coming in other jurisdictions too. Uh, you know, the second thing that COVID-19 has definitely done is it's made us thoughtful about productivity at job sites and the extent to which we have to be varying our assumptions about for any given job, uh, ultimately what our expectations would be about the social distancing that will be prevalent both now and moving forward, potentially through future waves of the pandemic. So all of this puts us into the posture of, of caring quite a bit around market capacity and investing heavily to try to understand what the genuine impacts would be. But I confess that I'm here a little bit to be educated a lot like many of the people I think on the uh, on the the broadcast today uh, uh, around uh, how industry thinks about whether there is a market capacity issue right now and in what ways it's been otherwise torqued or enhanced by COVID-19. But I guess the key message that I want to leave you with for this introductory preamble is just we are very much on receive and gripped of the potential issue for sure. Thank you very much, Mary. Speaking of the industry. <laughs> Uh, where where does the Canadian Construction Association stand on the issue of market capacity? Is there an issue right now? Uh, what has COVID-19 meant as a result? Well, you, you call it a simple question, but uh, it's a complex industry. Uh, so it's not uh, one simple answer. And certainly, if you look at uh, Canada prior to COVID-19, we had some hot pockets, particularly Vancouver and Toronto and uh, other areas where there was an abundance of work uh, available, such as Alberta. And if you look at also the Investing in Canada plan pre-COVID uh, and post-COVID, there are billions of dollars uh, on the table from federal uh, investments in infrastructure that have not been leveraged uh, by the provinces. Uh, Alberta is one of the leaders. They've, they've have commitments of about 75%, uh, BC, Nunavut, uh, around 50%. Other provinces are well below that, you know, 25% are below. So uh, there is still a huge appetite for infrastructure. Um, certainly COVID-19 uh, slowed down the industry. Um, we were very resilient, however, uh, 
being an essential industry in most parts of Canada or most of our sectors, uh, we, you know, we we carried on and uh, we changed our safety protocols every day. We created a national health uh, protocol, uh, which was created in collaboration with the federal government and with our members from across the country. So uh, we've shown that we can uh, withstand some pretty drastic uh, events that, that have happened in Canada. Um, certainly in the near term, we're looking at financial capacity, uh, not, not so much workforce capacity, but actually financial capacity. Uh, significant costs were incurred, whether that was for PPE, for sanitation, uh, delays in project leasing, you name it, and productivity, uh, to your point. And so one of the things that we've been working very hard on is to get those costs reimbursed now. We don't want our members don't want to wait two to three years later after the project to get these costs. Uh, they need that money now in order to be viable and ready for the ramp up uh, to, for the current projects, but also for the pipeline of projects that are, are so necessary. So we have asked the federal government for leadership in that area uh, on federal projects. Um, we've also hearing a bit that the private sector may be retrenching, maybe reconsidering. Um, you know, the thoughtful idea is also uh, sort of going into the private sector. We've heard as many as 50% of projects may have been deferred. Uh, so this certainly causes a chill for our members um, and thinking about, okay, well, what is that project pipeline? So we're not seeing a short term um, uh, or, or a longer term capacity issue. We're just catching up on our projects for today and the industry will be ready for that economic stimulus. Perfect. Bill, your perspective? Yeah, I, I would uh, concur with what Mary just said. Um, heading into 2020, we were looking at three very robust markets, British Columbia being the uh, probably the most robust, but Ontario and Quebec were also uh, very strong markets. Um, we haven't really seen any sort of cancellations in some of the significant major projects that we were tracking. Uh, in British Columbia, as an example, most of uh, the big projects that we were looking at and that the industry was really focused on were LNG Canada, uh, Site C, uh, the Coastal Gas Link, Trans Mountain. Um, those projects are proceeding. Uh, there may be, uh, again, we had uh, major projects, infrastructure projects in the greater Vancouver area. Uh, such as uh, the expansion of YVR, Petula Bridge, um, some infrastructure projects across the province that we were looking at. All of these were kind of stacking up on one on top of another, and that was creating a demand for some significant amount of labor. Now, thankfully for British Columbia, there had been a bit of a softening in the Alberta market. So um, they were looking to neighboring provinces to help uh, bring in the labor so that they could meet and keep up with the... Uh, uh, anticipated demand and investment demand that we were seeing in the province. And that really wasn't much of a challenge. We were starting to see that happening, the labor force moving into uh, the province, particularly up in the north for LNG Canada and Site C. It's a little bit more problematic and always will be to some degree in um, large urban areas, in part because of the cost of living. And that is part of the challenge when workers are considering whether to move to where the work is, uh, it's affordability. And, and that that's an ongoing challenge and that's true of not only Vancouver, but it's true of the greater Toronto area as well. Um, COVID-19, we really, as I said, haven't seen uh, any of the major projects that we were tracking um, uh, either canceled. We did see a few in, in places like Newfoundland and Labrador. So there will be some further softening uh, across the in parts of the country, but certainly not in the three markets that we were anticipating were going to experience the most significant amount of growth. Now it's interesting you guys say that so far, not not so far that we're not seeing any of the major project cancellations. Um, you know, last week we had a discussion with three big city mayors, and they were talking about the fact that if they don't get financial support soon, that infrastructure could be among that next round of cuts. Is there that concern? And I'll leave this open to, to any of the three of you that want to address it, but is there that concern that if some of those bigger municipalities don't get the financial support they need, that perhaps some of these bigger infrastructure projects that we're seeing 
could be next on the chopping block. I mean, I think of, you know, the example that, uh, that comes to my head is a place like Mississauga that had, you know, several hundred million dollar pipeline of transit projects with the Dundas BRT and a downtown transit center among uh, and a Lakeshore connector, among other things that were on the books, were in the process. And now because they're not seeing that financial support they need, perhaps some of those projects get slowed down. Are you seeing that concern at all from the market? Uh, maybe, maybe Mary, that's that's one for you to, to address. Absolutely, it's a significant concern about financial capacity and you know, municipalities have obviously been very hard hit. Um, and that is something we've been advocating with the federal government as well, is when we look at economic stimulus and infrastructure investment, we need to consider the entire chain. So it's it's the role of feds, the role of province, the role of municipalities. And it's so critical to Canada's well-being that we continue these investments. We're a trade country. Uh, we need to be competitive and uh, you know, stalling investments in infrastructure will hurt our economy. It'll hurt, you know, the 1.5 million workers in the industry. But construction also uh, supports a lot of other, uh, like manufacturers and suppliers, you know, the people who are making windows and doors and nails and you name it. So it's a very important economic um, generator of wealth for Canada and we need to keep those investments flowing and we need to help those municipalities be able to make those investments. Uh, it's quality of life, you know, you're bringing in clean water, you're bringing in community centres, you're bringing in hospitals, education, so uh, these are the very communities who need those investments. Yeah, and Andrew, maybe, maybe if I could offer a comment just to build on top of that, here I'll editorialize only for myself, not on behalf of the province <laughs> of Ontario in any way, but I think we we have probably all lived through the experience of trying to parse the difference between projects that are shovel ready and projects that are shovel worthy. And I think one of the things that we as an organization try to spend a lot of time uh, with uh, policymakers talking about is, you know, the need to balance trying to create some stimulus that feels immediate, is immediate. Uh, provides, as Mary says, a, a bridge for various parties uh, to ensure their continued viability and sustenance, but simultaneously doing so in a way that doesn't draw down the total quantum of funds that are available for what are genuinely, um, you know, fundamental, important, paradigm-shifting like investments in uh, various classes and assets of infrastructure. So I think getting that balance right, all three levels of government need to take it quite seriously. Uh, and and we, we risk, I think, collectively solving for speed at the expense of value. And so th th that more than anything, I think, is where I hope the thoughtful discussion is between governments will be joined, is joined uh, very soon. Bill, any thoughts? Well, the only caveat I would add to what was already said is that I hope uh, we learned from our experience of 2008 um, that we aren't going to impose artificial deadlines for completion of some of these projects. Um, what we saw in 2008, 2009 is governments wanted to see the money flow very, very quickly, um, which was important to get that money out uh, to industry. Uh, but some of the uh, completion deadlines uh, that they had attached at the back end became somewhat problematic. Construction is not, it doesn't happen in a sterile environment where it's not like building widgets uh, in, in an office setting uh, or in a manufacturing setting. All sorts of things happen along the way. We have to deal with weather. We have to deal with supply chain issues. And so imposing artificial completion deadlines while well-meaning because they were, they were well-intentioned because they wanted to see the money flow quickly. Um, they did create a lot of stress in the industry that was needless. Uh, so hopefully we'll keep that in mind this time uh, when we start looking at uh, stimulus projects and the kinds of projects we want to fund. We won't impose these artificial hard deadlines uh, just to get the money out the door that will really stress the industry to be able to complete. Yeah, just oh, sorry, go ahead, Mary. So just to add to that, uh, the investor confidence is so critical to the industry. Uh, that's what allows them to invest in people, to invest in training, to invest in equipment. If there are delays, if there are concerns, 
then that really shakes up the industry and we start to see uh, firms leave. We start to lose workers who go to other industries and we can't afford to do that. We, we uh, built up some capacity, uh, you know, we're ready for the stimulus and we can't afford to have the industry stall. Right. So I, I just want to go back to the, the fundamental market capacity point just for a minute, because I know uh, the, the three of you did a great job kind of outlining where some of those strong markets were and where, where we're seeing a lot of development. But I'm just wondering, are there, um, based on where we know development is likely to happen, based on where we know stimulus dollars are, are bound to be sent to, are there any areas of concern whether it be in individual provinces or whether it be in the national landscape where, you know, one too many major projects or, you know, doing too much at once could really put a strain on the workforce. Is there, is there any concern anywhere in the country where this could happen just based on current market conditions? We don't have any concerns at this time. No. Okay. I would echo what Mary's saying. Um, the fact is, is that the industry is very adaptable um, and the construction workforce is mobile. They're used to moving around to where the work is. Um, typically, when we start experiencing markets with tight labor markets in a given region, it's usually because there was a, a, a glut of projects that hit the street all at once. Um, and it takes a little bit of time for the labor to basically adjust. We've, we saw this in Alberta during the um, the early part of the 2000s when there was a lot of new capital being invested in the province's oil and gas sector. And yes, the local labor force was stretched. So what we started to see were uh, owners looking outside the province to try and supplement that local labor force. And we all have heard stories about uh, workers from Newfoundland and Labrador traveling to um, uh, Alberta, Northern Alberta to work in the oil and gas sector. And that happens. And that's, that's natural. That is what construction does. Um, when you're building in a remote area, you can't expect that you're going to find 1500 skilled trades people in that area. You bring them in for a period of time, you finish the project, and then they go back to where they came from. Um, the complicating factor when you look at places like Toronto and Vancouver is that there isn't the ability to really produce, to, to provide camps. Um, and also the economics of the industry, it's a very, it's, ICI is very different than say the oil and gas sector, which had the capacity to actually fly workers in from Newfoundland and Labrador and still remain profitable. It's a lot harder to do when you're operating in a low bid environment um, to suddenly bring people in and try and house them somewhere. And there is some hotel capacity and, and many employers are doing that where, where necessary. Um, but the margins aren't there in the industry to be able to do that the way it was possible to do, say, in the heyday of uh, oil and gas build out. Right. And I would and add I for our, sorry, Mary, after you, please. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we have to get our like hands up. You go first. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Figure that out. Uh, yeah, just to echo that, um, you know, that we, it does have to be strategic and the rollout does have to be even. And, you know, I don't want to say that we could handle, you know, some big blip. And, and we've talked about that. A boom and bust is not good for anyone. It does take the ramp up. Uh, you know, we talked about the engineer requirements up front. All, all that work takes time before it even gets to shovel ready. Uh, so there's, you know, a, a period of can be a couple of years before the projects hit the street. So we do very much support that steady, even flow of projects, all sectors, all sizes of, of firms all across Canada, so that as many communities can participate in uh, the economic stimulus. And again, we really... Our bigger concern right now is financial capacity, that uh, credit is available, that liquidity remains. You know, our, our many of our um, firms have had a period of, you know, several months of, of not full payment, if any payment. And that means that many of them won't get paid for another two to three months. So we need to make sure that they've got that funding in the near, near term and also as they're ramping up probably over, over the next you know, 12 to 18 months that many of those financial services programs uh, that the federal government introduced remain in place for the contractors so that they can do uh, the very important work. 
well said. And, and, and then just for our part, I want to leave the viewers with a sense that um, we are all about trying to identify barriers to the mobility of people that would otherwise come to Ontario and ultimately uh, be a productive part of our very ambitious pipeline, whether it's skilled trades people or globally mobile engineers or project management staff. Um, you know, this is, we, we spend a lot of time talking to provincial policymakers and decision makers about how indeed we make sure that we are genuinely sourcing not only the best from Canada, but also from frankly around the world uh, to come respond to, uh, to the pipeline that we have put out there. And sorry, Michael, can you expand on that at all? Is just like, has there been anything, uh, any, any issues of interest that have come up the last couple of years that you've been working to address um, as far as making sure that we have the skilled labor capacity that's necessary? Well, only ever indirectly, right, Andrew? I, I think ours is the job at Infrastructure Ontario of trying to extrapolate from the pipeline that we have to the needs that we have in respect of skilled trades and working closely with the Ministry of Labor and others in order to understand what, therefore, a broader policy response would be for the government of Ontario and how they should think about, um, you know, building uh, the workforce and, and particular categories of skilled trades. Uh, I think, you know, to be one degree more specific, there has been, for a period of years, lots of discussion that we've been having about the extent to which the project agreements that Infrastructure Ontario lets out are declarative or specific in respect of what we hope to see in, in the shape of the, uh, the the workforce that the project codes bring to us and, and any requirements that ultimately might be baked into that in respect, in respect of, uh, you know, models for apprentices, et cetera. Um, I would say that, you know, we continue to work with our friends at the Ministry of Labor to just try to figure out which policy mechanisms are ultimately the best ones, right? Mm -hmm. To to incept the coming together of, of the right workforce, which can be responsive, um, uh, whether it's things that we do that are baked into our procurements or our project agreements or wider government response. Mm -hmm. So it, it is, in fact, a pretty broad policy discussion that continues and, and you know, we play a part in it primarily by ultimately making plain to decision makers what our needs are ultimately gonna be. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanna address, there's an interesting question that just came in that I think would be great to address right now. If there is a capacity issue present, how do governments best stage and prioritize projects to make sure that the quote unquote important stuff gets done first? Um, Michael, I don't know if that's, if that's a question best directed at you to start, but, um, or if it's or if it's Mary or Bill in this case, but I, I'll put it out there to you guys. Uh, I just think that's an interesting one to address. Is that yeah? I mean, how do you make those priorities? I mean, Bill, it's to your point. I know a little bit about making sure you don't have those strict deadlines in place to be able to have the flexibility you need to be able to prioritize projects. But how else do you do that? I mean, it feels like in a lot of these communities, everything that's getting built seems to be a priority, especially with the amount of maintenance and repair that's underway. Yeah, no, look, I'm happy to take a first crack at it. I, I think that um, I, 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 I want to point at one important thing that I think wasn't subsumed within the original question, but bears quite a bit upon this conversation. And that is people, I think, have a tendency to, to, to think axiomatically about whether a project happens or it doesn't happen and the sequencing associated with that. I think what the present moment has done for, for many of the capital ministries of the government of Ontario uh, in respect of a few projects, it's put them into the space of not do we do the project or we, do we not do the project, but how do we configure the project for the world that we now find ourselves? How do we ensure that the bricks and mortar are suffused with the right technological adaptations that make for the right sort of end outcomes and user benefits and all the rest, whether you're talking about a courthouse or a long-term care facility or a hospital? So just to point at it as I answer the question, I, I think you know it's, it's, it's even one degree more complicated, if I can put it that way, because it's not just about taking a list of capital projects and deciding which ones go first. It's about in this moment also embracing the opportunity to be thoughtful about how you might reconfigure projects in order to amplify their value, right? Right. But you know, the, 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 the way in which I think it will play out is uh, you know, twofold answer to the question. Number one, I think it's fair to say that, uh, as you saw through the reaffirmation of IO's pipeline just last week, 
that you know many of the priorities in, in respect of major projects for the province of Ontario remain precisely those priorities. And the government is getting on with the doing of them from subways to other projects. So some of what I think was important was just a reaffirmation of the value inherent in many of the projects that were already planned. Mm -hmm. I think the second part of the answer is there's definitely going to be a conversation uh, that plays out at the center of the provincial government uh, this summer around what, if anything, uh, we, you know, we would add to that per particular pipeline that we, we reaffirmed last week. And, and there, there's a whole bunch of inputs around, uh, you know, uh, total financial capacity, uh, you know, the, the relative value associated with the return on investment for any given project on a ministry by ministry basis. I, I think the only thing that I can say, hopefully to give hope to the viewers is it's happening in a very coordinated way would be my observation. You know, the various uh, folks within government who are responsible for thinking through the answer to the question are talking to one another about it and talking to each other quite thoughtfully about what the answer would be. Bill, Mary? Certainly, Mary? Um, what we uh, have put together prior to COVID-19 was the Canadian Infrastructure Report Card, which we do in partnership with several uh, other organizations, including FCM. And this tool shows the um, levels of um, quality of infrastructure across seven different asset classes. And many of them are in weak to poor condition. So there is a, a real need to invest in not just new infrastructure we've talked about, but also the maintenance of the existing assets uh, that we have. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would echo what Mary just said. In fact, in many ways, we're still living with uh, a hangover from the 93 recession where we saw in particular in provinces like Ontario and Quebec, a significant amount of underinvestment in infrastructure, in part because we were trying to address other public policy questions such as deficit. Uh, but as a result, we went through almost 10 years of underinvestment in infrastructure. And to some degree, uh, at the same time, we had population growth added on top of that. And so our infrastructure, we're still trying to catch up our infrastructure is certainly not adequate to the needs of the current population. And I think what you're seeing is governments across the uh, across the country investing in infrastructure because, frankly, we're still trying to catch up for that lost decade of investment uh, going back to the early 90s. Um, now, with respect to, uh, you know, the sequencing of projects, I, I frankly, uh, to me, it really comes back to mobility. We have to ensure that the workforce, where it is currently, uh, where there is available pools of workers right now across the country, that we can create the right incentives for them to actually move to markets where there is strong demand for construction activity. Um, and that really is, a, in my opinion, a, a government function. Those are, those are things that can be done either through the tax system uh, or other incentives. Um, to enable workers that may be um, underutilized right now in certain provinces to look for work in provinces that frankly are looking for skilled labor. You certainly can't, given the amount of time it takes to develop a skilled trade person, um, expect that you can turn, turn training on and off to meet current capacity. It's just not possible. It's going to take three to four years before you have experienced journey people. Um, so what we need to do is better utilize the existing labor force, move it around to meet the current needs, uh, as opposed to trying to train or trying to develop a labor force to meet a peak need that will eventually recede once those projects are completed. Interesting. And it's interesting that you guys bring up the issue of deferred maintenance because, of course, uh, you know, we, we had our event last week, as I mentioned, with a couple of the big city mayors. And I can remember very, very clearly when uh, Mayor Mike Savage from the city of Halifax said that there is a crisis of deferred maintenance in this country. And it's interesting to hear um, Mary, Bill, Michael, all of you guys just basically touching on that issue that yes, there's, there is a great deal amount of focus that needs to go into asset maintenance and repair. And 
certainly that you know goes back to that shovel ready shovel worthy debate that we're all having as as part of the federal infrastructure stimulus funding should it be new projects with a ribbon to cut or should it be you know looking after some of that massive backlog of asset maintenance and repair that needs to be addressed i i want to bill i want to just build on what you just talked about with you know kind of shifting labor markets and being able to move people throughout the country because you know, one of the trends that we're seeing in, in other countries, and we're seeing it even more so during this global pandemic, is the idea of protectionism. And I'm wondering, you know, as we look to the federal government and the infrastructure stimulus dollars and the projects that they're going to be putting out throughout the country, do we think or should there be any sort of measures within those contracts to ensure that it is the Canadian labor market that's able to take advantage of that stimulus? Um, is that an issue that we need to address here in Canada or, you know, are we not as worried about international parties being able to come in and scoop up a, a great deal of that work? Uh, I, I think that's probably a, a question better answered by maybe uh, Mary. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I, I don't think you, if you ask anyone in construction in this country, whether they're in favor of protectionism, I think you'll hear all, everyone say unanimously that no, they're not in favor of protectionism, but they want fair trading rules. Um, and when you start looking at integrated supply chains, as we saw coming out of um, the last recession where the United States did, improve, did it impose certain restrictions, it created significant challenges because in many cases, the supply chain is structured across both borders. And so if you're trying to source uh, steel for a particular bridge in Pennsylvania, that steel may be produced in Canada and vice versa. We may need to source certain materials that are only available in the United States. So protectionism in and of itself is not a solution and frankly uh, is more of a hindrance. So I, I, I certainly don't believe you'd find anyone in the country that would support protectionism. I think what everyone wants is, is fair trade rules that um, provide equal access uh, on both sides of the border. Mary, Michael, one of you two want to jump in? I can go. Uh, certainly CCA's policy is that we are supportive of free trade. And uh, to Bill's point, it's really about fairness and contracting and having the ability for everyone to, to compete. So that uh, underlines everything that we do. We have firms who are multinationals who work in Canada, work in US. So uh, that's something we're all very comfortable with. I think with COVID-19, it certainly revealed the, uh, I guess the vulnerabilities in having such an integrated supply chain with other countries. Uh, you know, or not, and not just other countries, other, other provinces uh, where, you know, materials would need to pass through. And, you know, you know, some provinces had 14 day quarantine. So back to the labor mobility, that was a real issue. People could not move freely. So it's something we have to really keep in mind uh, as we look at COVID-19. It's not over. We all know that it's a very unpredictable disease. Uh, you know, good on Canada, federal government, all levels of government for and Canadians uh, for really flattening that curve and uh, getting us to where we are. Um, but we have to be prepared that these productivity issues can remain, uh, supply chain disruptions will remain. Uh, and so we're gonna have to be very flexible working with the owners on, on the contracts and what that means and how we're gonna deal with it. Uh, you know, contractors can't uh, write contracts where the owners say, well, that's, you know, whatever happens with COVID-19, that's on you, like that, that can happen. So um, that, that part of it's really important. In terms of international labor, Again, Canada has always been a very welcoming country. Uh, it's been a great source of us for many of our, uh, well, uh, for, for our citizens and also for the industry. What we are finding is that everybody's looking for that talent. Uh, Europe is older than we are uh, on average. And so they're, you know, amongst themselves, their own countries, they're all trying to fight to get to get those uh, skilled labor in particular. Uh, USA is in the same boat as us. They, they, they're looking for 
uh, for workers. So we're going to have to be really creative in uh, looking at maybe more non-traditional countries where we've had um, workers come uh, to, to attract. And that will be very welcome because it will make the industry more diverse. So we have uh, um, Maybe it's been a little bit easier in the past to get uh, people from other countries, but we're going to have to work uh, harder to get those people in. Michael? I, I think that both of those statements were incredibly well put, and, and I would absolutely echo everything that Bill said about the risk of unintended consequences and everything that Mary said about the value of flexibility. I think you know we're very much in the space of, of recognizing the veracity of both of those things and acting accordingly. Great. I uh, just want to go to the questions. There was a, another really interesting question that's come in. It's as the construction project cost might increase, will this affect the ability of hiring and training apprentices post COVID-19? Uh, very interesting, uh, you know, because obviously, I mean, we've already talked about financial constraints, but you're right. I mean, with those extra health and safety measures that need to be put in place, the escalating cost of that, how much more difficult does it then become to hire the people to be able to train them and get them into the workforce? Mary, that I see you. Like <laughs> What's that, sorry? That sounds like a bill question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, if, if you'd like, I, I can provide my thoughts. Um, I think this is still one of the challenges that we're struggling with. Um, there are costs, additional costs to PPE and um, the existing health and safety protocols that have been introduced as a result of COVID-19. How long they will last? Um, at this point, we don't know. Will there be a second wave? Again, we don't know. The one thing that I am extremely confident in is that the construction industry has always found a way to innovate. Um, and what it will do is it will find a way to accommodate. And we're starting to see that in British Columbia and uh, full credit to the CCA um, that introduced best practices very, very quickly that the industry adopted. Um, and, and as a result, in most provinces, we were a, the construction industry was declared essential and allowed to continue to operate throughout the COVID-19 crisis. Um, and, and I, again, it comes back to innovation and the ability to innovate. Certainly, um, this industry has always been very innovative. Sometimes unfairly, we get criticized for not being as productive as, as other industries. But the reality is, is you can't apply benchmarks to productivity that you would for, say, manufacturing to construction. You don't have... Manufacturing doesn't have to deal with weather. Manufacturing doesn't have to deal with some of the supply chain challenges that the construction industry does. Manufacturing doesn't have to deal with traffic just to get equipment moved from one part of the city to another. So often, unfortunately, the industry gets labeled as being laggards on productivity, but um, the reality is, is we're just not using the right uh, metrics to actually measure productivity in the construction industry. But it's a very innovative industry. And as most contractors will tell you, if you end up being low bid on a project, you will innovate. You have no choice. Good. Mary, Michael, your thoughts? I would only just echo Bill to say it has been genuinely impressive across uh, the breadth of our projects how the construction industry has kept going uh, at essential workplaces. Uh, you know, I, at least anecdotally, I can tell you this: I had the opportunity yesterday to tour a uh, project site with uh, with Minister McNaughton and representatives of uh, not only the Project Co but also of Labor, and you know, to get to see some of those adaptations close up, uh, you know, which have been put in place quite quickly. Um, it was genuinely, frankly, inspirational. Uh, and, you know, we're looking forward to having a conversation, uh, you know, with, uh, with the market and, and with our GCs and with others about as we move forward and we contemplate what public health guidance will look like, what the implications are ultimately in respect of cost. Uh, that's a conversation that will have its day and definitely needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Mary, did you have anything you want to add? Well, there were a lot of points there that uh, maybe I could build on and keep track of. Uh, the first in terms of apprenticeships, uh, critical to the industry, highly supportive of it. And one of our concerns was that education would be slowing down, uh, you know, because of COVID-19 and how would the online and the training and all that continue. So uh, very important that we keep that pipeline going, that those uh, people who are already in the apprenticeship 
uh, pipeline that we get jobs for them. And, you know, is it is it the cost of PPE that's going to be the issue? Or is it going to be more what I go back to, which is the confidence in having projects? If uh, the industry and firms know that they've got business, then they are more confident to take on an apprentice. Apprenticeships can take a couple of years before they get through everything. So that's really the big piece is having uh, knowledge that they have business, that they can hire an apprentice uh, to carry through with them. So that's that's really part of the apprenticeship. Uh, in terms of innovation, uh, take a slightly different tack from Bill in that uh, we think we could do a lot more with innovation. Uh, that low cost bid sometimes is an inhibitor to innovation because of the risk, not because they don't want to innovate, not because they don't know how, it's the risk. And if contracts are laid out very specifically, use this material, use this process, use whatever, then the contractor, the, the subcontractors, the whole chain ecosystem, they're not incented to innovate. They will deliver what they feel is the lowest risk solution in order to you know, protect their, their financial, to, to protect their business. So we do see a an opportunity to look at how can we do this differently? How can we share risk of innovation uh, between the owner and the contractors? Uh, can we use the Canadian Infrastructure Bank? Their role is around de-risking innovation. Uh, so how might we do that? Would benefit uh, not just current projects, but it could benefit you know many projects in the future. We want sustainability. Uh, we want uh, long-term uh, benefits for communities. So it's a really exciting area, and I you know could talk a long time about it. But that's we see huge uh, opportunities there. And just one little example from COVID nineteen was because of social and physical distancing. Uh, you know, a lot of um, uh, tasks require two people to carry something. And so there was some innovation around using helping tools. So it could be one person plus a helping tool to carry something. Um, so there, there's, you know, stuff happening and we can do a lot more of it. And then how do you ensure that, um, you know, you can still carry on that kind of very close apprenticeship work on a construction site when you have the physical distancing demands, you have the health and safety demands. Um, like, are we seeing, Mary, I'm kind of pointing this to you because I know the amount of work the CCA has done to ensure that there are really strong health and safety guidelines in place in the construction industry. What have you had to also adjust to be able to ensure that those people that are training on those sites um, also have the opportunity to be right there to to see everything being done very closely, but also be able to keep those health and safety measures in place? One of the reasons why the industry was uh, so resilient in adapting to COVID-19 is because it has a safety culture. This is not new to construction. There are safety briefings every day. I was uh, lucky to be able to go on a construction site pre-COVID. And even as a visitor, I was walked through the safety protocols. Here's what you do. How, here's the exit. Uh, you know, all those things. So it's it's just ingrained in how we do business. And apprenticeships, uh, apprentices are no different. They, they are taken through the safety protocols. They are explained how to do it. If they were in close proximity, there would be PPE for them. Um, so it's just, it's the way we do business. Michael, Bill, anything you want to add to that or? <laughs> I, I would agree with what Mary just said. Um, at this point, the issue around apprenticeship um, and, and how apprenticeship gets done coming out of COVID-19, it really depends on how long some of these measures are going to be with us, um, how the college system, um, how block training changes. Um, it, it's, it's difficult to project at this point. The one thing I come back to is that the industry will find a way around it, not around it, but will find a way to accommodate it. Um, but yes, there will be added costs and, and, and hopefully owners will take that into account um, because we, we cannot stop training. Uh, the reality is, is that we have a demographic challenge in this country that is going to hit us uh, over the next 10 years. And we have to continue training regardless of the actual economic environment. Otherwise, we're just going to exacerbate skill trade shortages later in the decade. So the best solution 
for training is always economic growth. And it's and this is exactly what we saw in Alberta. Uh, when Alberta, it, at the height of its labor force challenges, we really started to see registrations increase dramatically in apprenticeship as a result of growth in the construction sector. And so really what we have to do is maintain that growth. We have to continue to find ways to incentivize smaller employers because 60% of this industry is made up of micro businesses. And if those micro businesses don't have the proper incentives to take on an apprentice, and many of them can't because they don't really have much of a backlog. Their pipeline of projects might go out one or two. And as a result, they're reluctant to uh, indenture an apprentice uh, if they don't have some sort of security as to how long they might need that individual for. So we have to find a better way uh, to incentivize smaller employers. And in my opinion, it really is through the tax system, better ways to incentivize smaller employers to actually participate in apprenticeship development. Um, and, and that is something that I think everyone um, in the industry would agree on. And I hope that uh, government will um, be able to at least to review their current um, um, their current programs and see how they can um, try and create better incentives to uh, better engage smaller employers in apprenticeship development. Michael, I want to I want to point something at you. We had a question about it, and it builds perfectly on our our discussion of developing the labor force, and that's around community benefits agreements. Um, you know, we we've seen it with the Eglinton LRT. We've seen now that that British Columbia is off and running with it with some of their major projects. Um, from the as much as you can say from the I/O perspective, um, where does the idea of community benefits agreements stand as far as you know, building that extra layer of pipeline, but also helping some of the neighborhoods that are impacted by this construction development of, as we've seen with Eglinton. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Uh, again, um, I think we understand the the impetus and the, the, the objective behind community benefits agreements, Andrew. I think you put that well. I, I think what government is thinking through right now is what the correct mechanism is to get after some of those objectives and some of those benefits. Uh, and, uh, you know, the extent to which the, the model that we had prescribed in previous procurements is the right one. So don't have a lot that's specific to share on this, but I, I would affirm that, yeah, this is definitely a policy discussion that's happening within government right now. And I think it's fair to say that, you know, COVID-19 and the present pandemic with many of these policy discussions has, has put a different top spin on them. Right. So, uh, more to say when we can't say more. Mary, Bill, anything you want to add on the topic of community benefits agreements is whether or not they're something that we should be continuing to push provincial governments to pursue for some of their projects? Not me. Go for it, Mary. It, again, it's one of these very complex topics mm -hmm. subject to multiple different interpretations. Right. And we've seen everything from uh, applying conditions on the workforce makeup to um, open-ended questions on contracts like what are you going to do for us in addition to building XYZ. Uh, so our contractors will bid on contracts that are well defined and what they know they are expected to do. We have to be very careful in making sure that we're not working at cross purposes. So I don't know, half an hour ago, we were talking about the how important it is to have mobility in the workforce. And you know, Bill was talking about that. We were all talking about that. Uh, one unintended consequence of some of these agreements is that it limits workforce mobility. And mm -hmm. Uh, as I think Bill said earlier as well, not every community has the makeup of uh, the, the underrepresented groups that we might all like. So it's, it's a very complex area. We all believe in generating increased benefits for Canadians. Um, you know, part of that's just the clean water. Uh, but it's also how we thoughtfully engage and build 
that workforce. So, you know, we, we look at um, high school is a very important time when people will consider a career in construction, in skilled trades. How much effort are we putting there to attract women, to attract Indigenous, to attract uh, new Canadians to, to construction and to skilled trades? It's kind of late in the process at the contracting stage um, to put those requirements on. And I, I believe it's something like uh, 3% of uh, women are in skilled trades, something like that. Uh, and Bill would know these stats much better than me. Um, but it's not evenly distributed across every community and it's not evenly distributed across every trade. So these are things we have to work together on to build the workforce that is uh, more representative so that it's not an issue, right? We just, th this is what the industry looks like and these are the people and they're just working uh, and they're happy to work. So we, as an industry, uh, one of the things we're working on is something called Talent Fits Here to position construction as a career of choice. Uh, because women are working, they're just not working necessarily in the skilled trades. New Canadians are working, they're just not necessarily working in, this, in, uh, in construction. So these are some really big issues uh, that we want to uh, uh, address and that we are working on. And people have been working on this, you know, for the last 10, 15 years, trying to solve this issue and how do we get these underrepresented groups in. So, sorry, a, a long answer, uh, maybe not an answer, but, um, you know, it's, it, it has a lot of pieces to it uh, that we need to work on together because it's not just one thing that's going to change it. It's, it's a whole mindset around working in construction, working in skilled trades uh, for the underrepresented groups. Well said, mm -hmm. Bill. Michael, anything else you want to add to that? No, it's very well said. Very well said, Mary. No, I agree. With, I, I I agree with everything Mary just said. And, and it's an interesting point that you brought up, Mary, because um, I, I know certainly some of the conversations that we've had because we've been talking a lot about this very issue for the past several months. Um, and one of the big points, that, or one of the big questions, we keep coming back to is how do you ensure that every single high school student in every single high school across the country knows construction is an option? And it's, and it's one of those massive, huge picture issues um, that there is no easy answer to, but at the same time, seems to be an answer we need to figure out um, is to ensure that, you know, whatever's happened in schools previously, now it's construction is told as a career just along with every college option, every university option that there is that can be that can be had. So it's uh, it's great that you touch on that point. And I want to talk about, you know, now we talked about the education sector and now we talked about community benefits. I'm wondering, what are those other pieces? What are those other resources we need to look to as far as encouraging people into the construction industry um, because like like you said Mary it's it's a multi-layered issue there's no one silver bullet answer that's going to solve it and I'm just wondering your thoughts on where else the construction industry can look to uh, to be able to recruit those that next group of workers if it's not high school if it's not community benefits agreements, where is it? Where else can we look? Well, back to the education sector, uh, university is also obviously a big part of it. Uh, we need the science, technology, engineering, math students. Um, again, if you look at the makeup of who's uh, enrolling in those programs and who's graduating, uh, construction is competing for those very valuable resources along with every other industry. And again, if uh, we're not seeing the uh, underrepresented groups coming into those programs and graduating, it's hard for us to recruit uh, from them to come into construction. And Go Construction's uh, image is not necessarily in keeping with where we are today. I think a lot of people see construction, you know, what they see on the roads and and they don't see a lot of the exciting design work that's happening. They don't see all the advances in artificial intelligence that are happening. Uh, they don't see the big data modeling, you know, BIM, all those things that are really exciting, uh, the research and development 
we don't talk enough about that as an industry, and we need we need to do more of that to uh, present the really the exciting things that are happening. And if I think about millennials, you know, they really want to connect their work with purpose. And what could be more inspiring than you know bringing in uh, a new school, uh, building an amazing bridge that lasts forever and connects people, uh, bringing in broadband to the north. So there, there's so many uh, inspirational projects that people work on every day. And as an industry, that's something that we need to do more promotion of, and certainly working with uh, all levels of governments to to promote the industry as a career of choice. Bill, Michael. I would echo everything that Mary just said. Um, I would also add on that. Um, there, there are a variety of things that we should be doing. Um, and, and government is taking notice. And as a result of industry pressure for some time to do a better job of promoting careers in construction, certainly careers in the skilled trades, we now see the federal government um, advancing a, a stronger marketing campaign to get that message out to youth. The province of Ontario has done the same. A variety, there are a variety of, of provincial and federal initiatives right now doing exactly that, trying to get real information in the hands of young people. One of the challenges, of course, that we face are parents that would be my generation that throughout the 1980s were hit with ads basically saying, if you don't go to university, you're not going to have the same great life that all the people you see on TV have. So we're still trying to address that challenge. And of course, uh, if guidance counselors go to university, they're, whether they like it or not, they're going to try and push kids to go to university first before they go off and explore careers in the skilled trades. And what we're starting to see is that a great many university students after two or three years in university or even after completing their degree say, I don't want to work in an office. This is not fulfilling. And then they come back to the skilled trades uh, and they come back to the construction industry. They typically start around 27 or so. That's when they start reconsidering, is this what I want to do with the rest of my life? And those are the people that there's huge opportunities among uh, not only to attract young people into the industry, but also those that after they've gone through university aren't necessarily fulfilled. Let's see if we can't find ways to bring them into the industry. We have Helmets to Hard Hats, which is a great program to take our veterans and try and find them careers in the construction industry. But the reality from my perspective is this. The demographics of the country are changing and we are going to have more uh, workers retiring than young people available to come into the industry. So as a result, we're going to have to look to um, immigration uh, as part of the solution. Uh, the reality is, is we haven't had a positive birth rate in this country since 1971. We have become increasingly dependent on uh, immigration for population growth, and that trend isn't reversing. So we have to find a way to better engage um, not only those that are already here that have come in as immigrants and they're already here, their kids, um, but also have to find better ways of be able to, uh, for the industry to be able to recruit from abroad. What we have found when we have actually looked at the numbers, those coming in to Canada work in the construction industry not only adapt more quickly, um, their salaries are higher than the average immigrant coming into the country uh, within those first five years. Uh, and they tend to integrate more quickly into Canadian society as a result of having a job. Um, so they're not a burden on, the, on, on Canadian society. Their unemployment rate tends to even be lower than uh, Canadian born. Uh, in the construction industry. So we really need to take a look at policies and thankfully the federal government has introduced the, P, the uh, provincial nominee program and we've started to see some growth in terms of recruitment from abroad through the provincial nominee program. But we need to be looking at immigration as also part of the solution because the reality is, is immigration is driving population growth now in the country and will for some time to come. Michael, anything you wanna add? Look, in, the, in this space, I'm a passionate recipient of thoughtful analysis and research that's done by Build Force and CCA. I, I think that's incredibly well said. Uh, you know, to complete the, the cycle, I think we could e equally point out once you've inculcated within a generation of uh, Canadians a desire to make a, a life in construction in the skilled trades, uh, you know, how do you do the things thoughtfully in industry in partnership with government to make sure, for instance, 
completion rates are where they should be in respect of apprenticeships. And the OCOT study from November, I think, was utterly fascinating to me in respect of uh, some of the challenges there. Highly analogous, as Mary is saying, to you know the, uh, the 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 university careers that begin with a particular discipline but never seem to actually consummate right in 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 a, a long term career. So. I, I think uh, you know we'll continue uh, to be, uh, and we're very fortunate to be. I think a transmission vessel for this type of research to uh, to relevant policymakers, uh, certainly at the province, and uh, salute all of the thoughtful research that's being done out there on the question. Go ahead, Mary. Just uh, uh, we did some focus group uh, research with a group of kids and and their parents. And uh, you can go to our website and it's under, it's called the unconference and you'll see it's, it's, you know, why my kid, why I don't want my kid to be in construction. And they're a very genuine, you know, what they have to say about their perceptions of the industry. And certainly if you have a few minutes to, to listen to what the kids have to say and then what their parents have to say, it's uh, quite revealing. Yeah. And, and maybe just to add one coda to that, I, I, I think, you know, in microcosm, it's it's not directly analogous, but if, if I think about the young people that are employed by Infrastructure Ontario on the owner's side in respect of these projects, what is definitely true is when we ask them about the value proposition of coming to work for an organization like ours, they really take a pride in the notion that they are building the connective tissue of society. Uh, and I think that that probably is no small part of a message that would resonate for any young Canadian, uh, particularly in this moment. Uh, you know, associated with a potential career in the construction industry of the trades. We've got a couple more really good questions that I, I really want to get to. Um, this one especially, I, I don't know if the, any of the three of you are in a position to be able to answer this, but I'm, I'm curious if you are. Uh, what is the panelist's opinion on capacity for with specific relationship to low carbon buildings, especially deep energy retrofits and new zero carbon construction? Do we have the capacity to, that we need right now and how do we build or strengthen it? Um, cause that's certainly something that, that we've heard in a few other discussions that we've hosted is that as we look to these new and innovative ways of building, do we have the skill set to be able to do it? And, and if not, who do we need to reach out to? Is, is this something that we, you know, a discussion we need to have with the colleges, with the universities? Um, so I'm curious to get, um, whichever one of the three of you want to address this first, I'm curious to hear your opinions on this because it, it is a very important question right now. Okay. Can I talk about it once? <laughs> no, uh, I, I would say this. Um, the, construct, the construction industry will build whatever it is asked to build. Um, to some degree, a lot of this is really more uh, innovation uh, at the engineering level and the design level. Um, the construction, yes, there will be some retraining required, but that kind of training happens anytime you have to install a new component, whether it's moving to solar panels away from a traditional roof. Sure, there's going to have, there's going to be a little bit of a transition period where you have to educate the worker on how, what the differences are between the, 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 the components that they are installing. But in the end, the electrician is still an electrician. They still have to understand electricity. They still have to understand how to hook things up. Um, so it, it, in many ways, I, I, I don't think that it requires a fundamental rethink of the labor force. Um, it will obviously have some changes or have some impact on how apprentices are developed in the future. Of course, you want them to be um, educated on the latest uh, technologies. Um, but to some degree, this is a technology issue more than a fundamental skills issue. The, the theoretical elements required for the specific trades don't really change. It's really just a question of application and how you work with the materials, how you work with the products that you are installing. Okay. It's, it's kind of where my mind goes too, right? In the, in the preamble, I, I talked about how at least at I.O., or in Ontario, we think about market capacity as having a couple of different dimensions. One of them is definitely sort of total capacity of the construction sector and the availability of skilled trades. But to Bill's very good point, we, we equally think about it around professional services and the extent to which we have, uh, you know, the right designers who are conversant in and will lead the innovation in respect of these types uh, of adaptations. So, 
uh, yeah, I agree entirely with Bill. I, I think a lot of this is bound up in do we have the people who are able to help uh, policymakers and asset owners think through, uh, you know, how you would incorporate some of this very important um, adaptation, which uh, bears on, uh, you know, definitely policy outcomes that are important to government. The caveat I would add, or I, one additional point I would add to this is that a lot of times it comes down to um, materials and what the owner wants. And so to some degree, it's going to come down to what are, what are owners looking for uh, and what are they prepared to pay for? Because it's not that the construction industry can't deliver, it's that owners don't ask for it. And so if you continually ask for um, something that meets a specific spec, well, that's all that the contractor is going to do because they have to meet that specification. If you want to incentivize innovation in the industry, and we see a little bit of this with P3s because of course some of the shackles are off, you're now asking contractors to innovate and exercise their best. Like as an example, uh, I, I know the 407 was over-engineered to minimize long-term maintenance costs, but that was only possible because it didn't actually have to meet provincial specs. When you have very rigid specifications for the type of product that you actually want to see, then there's no room there for innovation. So yet the contractor gets blamed for not being innovative, but really it's the specifications that aren't innovative. And I can understand why nobody wants to take a chance on something that is new um, that may not necessarily deliver the end result that they were looking for and then have to answer for it publicly. But the reality is, is if we're going to see innovation, we have to unshackle the industry. And, and we still find that specs are way too rigid. Um, and often, even when public owners, and this isn't a, 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 a shot directly at you, Michael, but good, you know, yeah. often, even often when uh, public owners pull back from those rigid specs, they often reinsert themselves in the process. And, and that creates all sorts of challenges. I, the industry really has to be provided with some flexibility if we're going to get to that point. And, 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 and frankly, I think we should reconsider low bid because it does not necessarily generate the best outcome for taxpayers often on these projects because you're just looking at short term results as opposed to over engineering something that might give you an asset that lasts 100 years as opposed to 20. Yeah, it's, it's so well said. And, and we're right in that space. And indeed, in, in some recent procurements that many uh, that, that are, are watching this call might have participated to, we've actually been trying, right, to, to place a greater emphasis on flexibility and respective design, taking a different approach to DPMs, absolutely revisiting whether we've got gearing and evaluation criteria and sequencing right. Uh, I would absolutely affirm what Bill's just said. Uh, you know, want to make sure that our procurement processes and the way that they play out do give us the best and clearest view of potential innovation and that we are not, through unintended consequences, being overly dogmatic about our own specs. We really should care mostly about outcomes. And uh, it's a continuous uh, uh, journey and improvement in, in trying to be more in that space. Mary? Yeah, I know I agree with everything Bill said and appreciate, Michael, your comments on uh, Infrastructure Ontario being open to that and, and to trying to come up with that with that uh, solution. And certainly if my colleague uh, John Gamble were here from the Association Consulting Engineers of Canada, he would say, you know, they they welcome the challenge. They uh, want to be part of the solution on sustainability and, and happy to work on any of those projects. Mm -hmm. Just going to go back to the questions again, because I know there are a couple more uh, in here. And uh, Mary, this one kind of goes back to something that you've already mentioned. But a uh, question from Juliana is, there's a lot of focus on skilled trades. But what about design, engineering, and building operation capacity? Uh, where do we stand with the professional workforce capacity? And I know, like I said, Mary, I know you touched on that. And, and Michael, certainly it's been a conversation we've had with IO in the past and have published a few articles on this on this very issue. But just kind of where are we currently on this? Uh, where Where are those issues? Yeah, again, what we're definitely seeing is this uh, war for talent, and it goes certainly beyond uh, the skilled trades. It does go to the the STEM uh, area as well. Um, the 
the industry is not seen as sexy, let's say, as working for a Shopify or, or working for Microsoft. You know, if you're in the engine, if you're in computer engineering at any rate, uh, computer sciences. So that is something that we're we really have to dial up in order to attract uh, those really you know best minds. And again, if we're also looking very much at diversity, because we know diversity of thinking is is really what uh, leads to a lot of innovation, how can we attract those uh, those groups as well? So we're very aware of the um, the the need to keep attracting those people. Uh, as I understand it as well, uh, a lot of uh, procurement uh, people with procurement knowledge, particularly on the uh, owner side has been decreasing with retirements, you know, Bill alluded to that. And so we need to also make sure that our owners um, are able to get the people that they need uh, so that, you know, we have smart people uh, working in this system collectively. So it, it's, um, it's something we need to keep working on. Mm -hmm. Bill, Michael, one of you two wanna jump in? I feel like I've pointed at this issue a couple of times already in our, our conversation. It's you know, definitely on our mind. Uh, and Mary is, is absolutely right. It, it is uh, getting the balance right as between who helps us as an owner and a contracting authority and, and who is uh, out there responding to the tenders that we put out and infusing them with the kind of innovation and design that we ultimately want. Um, you know, to go all the way back to the preamble, I think it was the very first thing that I said that we have a responsibility as uh, as an owner's team doing, and, and that is making sure that we are to the greatest extent possible providing real transparency about the staging plan. And to go one step further, thinking quite intentionally about uh, you know things down to the level of conflict of interest policies and how that can create unintended consequences for us of disqualifying or ultimately ultimately making people unavailable, right? To 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 the wider uh, wider market and industry uh, to be able to bring their talents to bear. So. Some of this for us, I guess what I'm pointing at is deeply structural. And, and we just wanna make sure that, uh, you know, we, we don't dint of, of, of neglecting the need, um, you know, wind up in a place where we're trying to bring a bunch of projects to market uh, and finding ourselves unable to marshal the right sorts of uh, design capacity in order to get them done and to get them done on an innovative basis. It keeps, it keeps my friend David Ho and I up quite a bit. <laughs> Bill, anything you want to add to that? I would just echo the demographic challenge that with the country is facing doesn't just apply to the skilled trades. It applies across the board. It applies to uh, the back office construction um, uh, professions as well as other industries. And the reality is, is that we are increasingly, as Mary just pointed out, in greater competition with other industries for the smaller pool of young younger workers coming into the labor force. So we have to be even more nimble and, and, and find ways to uh, incentivize uh, their entry into the construction industry, ways to really excite them about construction. And, and I think there are a variety of initiatives that are going on that do exactly that. Um, it's, it's really just a question of uh, in, uh, providing them with as much information about the exciting careers that exist in construction, because Mary touched on a number of the innovations in particular that are going on in the, in the back office space, really, whether it's BIM, whether it's um, estimating, whether it's it really just electronic or digital design that um, is out there now. Uh, and there are going to be even more innovations when you start adding artificial reality and virtual reality uh, to training and start using augmented reality glasses on construction sites. I mean, the, the changes that can come about as a result of interfacing augmented reality glasses with BIM, um, you know, even the inspection process for a lot of the work starts to get redundant because you've got independent verification immediately that the work has been done according to spec. So it really does free up, um, in the case of, a, say, a skilled tradesperson, it really does free them up from the kind of administrative functions. And a lot of that requires uh, a lot of IT on the back end. Um, and and that's that really is, I, I mean, in terms of growth, there's just equal amounts of growth on that on that side of the, um, uh, the business as well that really cannot be overlooked. Um, and, and just ensuring that we, we have the right number of engineers uh, in the industry to be able to do the design work because 
ultimately, as I said earlier, construction is about delivering on something that somebody else designed. Uh, and so we will we will build what or the industry will build whatever it is asked to build. But ultimately, it comes down to the designers and the engineers coming together and putting together those kind of innovative new concepts um, and then uh, asking the construction industry to, to build it. And so, I, yeah, I, the, the issue exists. Uh, it, coming back to demographics, the issue exists because the, the reality is, is our population is aging and there are fewer young people coming into the labor force. And so competition is very tight and we have to pay um, a significant amount of attention to that if we're going to succeed. Well, it, it, sorry, go ahead, Mary. So one of the other programs uh, that we've been working on is a student work integrated learning program. And uh, the federal government has a, a program and we've applied for funding for that. And what that would do is it would allow us to uh, place students in STEM uh, with the industry. So uh, they could get exposed to what construction is about because they may not think, you know, they may have a different view of it and then they can experience something completely different. So that's another tool that we can use to get students you know, earlier before they've made their final career choice uh, about uh, construction and they could work on some of these projects, whether that's, you know, the virtual reality that uh, Bill talked about, computer science, whatever it happens to be on an engineering project. So that's another uh, initiative that we'd really like to bring to the industry to help expose more university students to careers in construction. And certainly there seems to be a lot more really good stories that we can tell as far as, you know, showing people that kind of innovative thinking and at the design stage, the engineering, the construction, you know, the, the project that always comes to mind for me and, and Michael, I know it's one you're familiar with is, is Humber River Hospital in Toronto. I mean, where, you know, it was, it was innovative design thinking at the very get go, there's, you know, robots and AI and modular construction and new thinking on um, environmental elements and HVAC, and, you know, like when you, when you bring all those elements together and you want to talk about construction as an exciting career and where the innovation is, you know, do I, I, you know, I almost wonder, do we need to be telling more of those kind of stories of being able to show some of these projects at the very end and say, look at all the different innovative elements from everybody involved that had to come together to build this really awesome thing that is going to help so many thousands of people if not millions of people in the long run um you know per, perhaps that that's you know i think we've touched on it several times you know maybe we have to tell a better story about ourselves and and uh, you're right mary i mean i think that's great to be able to get out to the university students because it sounds like that perhaps that's also somewhere that we need to do some work and perhaps I need to be uh, getting Renew Canada into more of these STEM programs in the university and getting it in front of them as well, uh, just to be able to, uh, to educate them on all the cool things we're doing as well. Uh, we've only got a few minutes left, but I do want to get to one last question that's in here because we have talked uh, quite a bit about uh, promoting skilled trades and construction as a career to, to different underrepresented groups. Um, but we only really touched on training capacity and what's needed to support demand. I, I know that, you know, a month ago when we had our May discussion, we were talking about um, construction, health and safety, and we learned a little bit about some of the things that Leona is doing as far as new methodologies for meeting that training demand. But what else do we need to do uh, currently with COVID, but also seeing this glut of potential infrastructure investment? What else do we need to do to ensure that we have the training capacity to be able to make sure that everyone is uh, is ready to be able to jump on these job sites and get the work done? I don't know, Bill, I'm looking at you on this. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I think you've touched on a couple things. Um, First off, getting back to my earlier point, um, it takes some time uh, to actually develop uh, an experienced trade person uh, to get them through to certification. The college capacity um, has been expanded and, and, and that as frankly, we saw both colleges and universities, we saw that capacity, that training capacity expanded as a result of the last recession when the federal government actually invested in, in um, a significant infrastructure program to allow those colleges to build out those 
uh, that training capacity. And as a result, what we've started to see is more temporary or more foreign students actually uh, being educated here in Canada. Um, but there are limitations to uh, the amount of seats that are currently available. Um, the union training centers are another, uh, obviously do a lot of work in this space, um, developing uh, workers, uh, but not just uh, the progressive unions do as well, as well as um, uh, those open shop contractors that are also engaged in apprenticeship development. It, it requires, frankly, a, a variety of, of, frankly, the entire industry to come together to address this question. Um, but I, I don't believe that there are capacity issues. What the big issue from my perspective is, is the industry going to be resourced to be able to do that? And if we see a decline in construction volumes, then absolutely the industry becomes, um, has less capacity to be able to invest in apprenticeship development. And so the best solution in terms of labor force development is always uh, growth. Uh, and so as long as we continue to invest and continue to see a robust construction environment, as we did see, and I, I come back to Alberta as an example of this, um, we started to see a significant rise in not just apprenticeships, but about four years, five years later, we start to see a rise in certifications as well. So when there's growth, when there's robust volumes of activity in a market, then you do start to see employers investing heavily in training. But training takes four years. There's always going to be that lag. So it can't be seen as just an immediate solution to today's problems. But when we look at the overall demographics, it's something that the industry has to pay attention to because if we don't train today, um, then in four or five years, skilled labor shortages that we're experiencing, that we were experiencing in parts of the country before this crisis are only going to be exacerbated. So we need to continue, we need to, continue to invest in skilled labor, in skilled force uh, or um, skilled labor development. And the best way to do that is to continue to invest in the construction industry so that the contractors have the resources that they need to be able to do that. Mary, Michael, anything you want to add to that? Mary? Well, uh, uh, just to add again what I said before is this goes back to the confidence of the industry. If they know that there's a steady, consistent pipeline ahead of them, that there is work, they will be happy to take on apprentices. Um, as Bill had said earlier as well, 60 to 70 percent of the industry is small, medium sized enterprises. So we have to consider their flow of projects as well and how we can encourage um, and send them to uh, take on apprentices. So hardly agree. We need continuous investment. And that is what will lead to the hiring and uh, development of, of apprentices. Michael, anything you want to add? You no, know, we take very, very seriously the commitment to try to be as transparent as we possibly can be about the pipeline of work that's uh, that's coming uh, coming down at uh, the industry, and I think we've benefited inordinately in in the last ten years from the fact that, dare I say, relative to other jurisdictions, we've we've done a reasonably good job of providing that predictability to the uh, the industry, and so we will continue to do so. It's why, you know, last week's pipeline announcement was important. It's why we'll be back. Uh, in the fall to talk about any changes that have ultimately been made. Um, completely agree and, and would say that we are we are certainly doing our part. It's an ambitious capital program in and of itself right now here in Ontario. So there's uh, there's lots of work to be done and I tend to agree with Bill that that is the best surety of making sure that you uh, you get investment in um, in building capabilities and, and building rewarding careers for people. Perfect. Bill, sorry. Yeah, yeah just one final point, and this really ties into exactly what Mary was talking about. Um, most of the apprenticeship development does actually take place by trade contractors, and trade contractors, by their very nature, tend to be smaller operations. So we have to ensure that the smaller contractor remains healthy, because if that smaller contractor is impacted or we start to see many of them disappear as a result of COVID-19 and the liquidity issues that Mary was talking about, then we've got a big problem because not only do you lose that training capacity, but you've also lost uh, a good chunk of the industry that frankly serves the larger general contractors. Um, and, and we can't afford to allow that to happen. So we really do need to pay close attention to that. And I'm sure Mary has a, a final point on that, but, um, but it is important and it's something that can't be overlooked and that hopefully governments are paying attention to. 
Mary, did you want to build on that? Yeah, I guess uh, just, yeah, two things. Um, again, thank you for Structure Ontario for the work on building pipelines and the transparency and communicating that. That's something we've been asking of the federal government as well. Yeah, we've asked very ambitiously for a 25-year pipeline. Uh, so again, because uh, they're big projects, you know, we've talked already about shovel-worthy, shovel-ready. Shovel well, it's really hard to make shovel-worthy discussion uh, decisions in, you know, a three-year sort of four-year election period. So, um, you know, to the extent that we could could do that is really, really uh, helpful to the to the industry. And yes, the liquidity issue for our, our smaller firms, for sure, smaller, medium sized firms, you know, the immediate term and certainly looking out to the next uh, two years, really important that we monitor that and that we're prepared to, to do what we need to do to keep those firms healthy. Thank you very much. With that, we are out of time. So thank you very much to Bill, Mary and Michael for taking the time this morning to join us. I'm sure all of our listeners today will get a lot of that out of the conversation. I know I certainly did. So thank you to all three of you. Um, as we say goodbye to Bill, Mary and Michael, just want to let everybody know as far as the deliverables from today's conversation, there will be a news story based on today's conversation on the Renew Canada website, renewcanada.net, in the days ahead as well. This discussion will be part of a feature story that will be in the September-October edition of Renew Canada. I want to also remind you that we hold these discussions on the last Thursday of every single month. We try to talk about the most important issues facing the industry right now, and we just have released our pipeline, so we now have the next five of these events along with the dates and times for all of them. So you can follow actual media here on Crowdcast. That is the easiest way for you to find out about the next events. But I do want to mention that our next one comes Thursday, July 30th, where we will be discussing designing infrastructure for disruptive events. Thank you very much to all of you. And remember that this conversation will be available via recording sometime within the next few hours at this very link. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, as it says, please don't forget, take a quick second, answer the polls and uh, be able to get a complimentary subscription to Renew Canada as a result. So thank you everyone for joining us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next event on July 30th. Have a great day.